And um, today we're going to talk about uh, youth action against um, AMR. Just want to let everyone know that I am recording this session. I'm going to save uh, the session afterwards for guests who are not uh, able to participate today. Uh, but um, it's 11 o'clock. I think uh, we should start. I know that there are more people joining, but uh, they will have to catch up with us as they come along. Okay, let's see if I'm going to be able to share my slides with you. So there you go. Uh, today's agenda then, uh, we have three of our grantees joining us today. I'm very happy to have both Eric, Jespreet and Daniel with me today. They are going to talk about their uh, programs that they work on. Uh, but first, I would like to start and just uh, mention a few words about PAR Foundation and who we are. We started uh, five years ago. We're an independent organization. And PAR Foundation is driven uh, by making global change in supporting research and educative initiatives in the area of prevention of antibiotic resistance. Um, so far, since the start, we have uh, been able to uh, grant 17 projects funds to work on this important uh, topic. Our vision, um, our vision is to help eradicate the spread of antibiotic resistance. Uh, this is one of the most important challenges that we stand in front of as uh, a joint uh, collective globally. And the way we believe that we can make a difference here is uh, by using our uh, forces, and that is to support teams that work on research and health um, uh, topics. And we want to educate the uh, health professionals working with this to prevent the antibiotic resistance. And if we take joint action together with um, people like yourselves, uh, we believe that we will be able to both educate key opinion leaders, but also support the health sector and engage the next generation of uh, researchers. And that will ultimately, we believe, lead to the fact that we will influence politicians and decision makers that can support and fund uh, these type of projects and put more resources into that and, and help by focusing on the work to uh, reach this pretty uh, uh, aggressive goal to eradicate the spread of antibiotic resistance. Like I said, how do we make a difference then? Well, we have decided to zoom in and focus on working with key opinion leaders in the field of uh, health. And uh, by doing so, we believe that we, together with these individuals, will influence politicians and the industry. But that would also lead to academia getting more uh, funding to their important work. But these opinion, uh, key opinion leaders will also be able to uh, talk to the general public, to spread their word and, and help educate and, and inform uh, the general public, which leads to holding and preventing the spread of antibiotic resistance. Today, then, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce three of these key opinion leaders that we believe in, which is um, Eric, Jespreet, and, um, and Daniel. And I will start by handing over the word to Eric Mugabo in Rwanda. 
And Eric, you will talk about uh, your project that you do in your organization, Oasis Health. So Eric, please take it away. And you have to unmute as well. <laughs> yeah, thank Super, you so thank much, Sria. Uh, for giving me the floor, and I would like to greet everyone attending this webinar. Uh, from wherever they are, either good morning or good afternoon. Uh, here in Rwanda and Kigali, it is in good afternoon. So we are already past 12 uh, p.m. So hope to be with you all as we talk about use actions against antimicrobial resistance. And specifically, I'm going to take you through what Oasis Health is doing in Rwanda uh, through our antibiotic stewardship program. Uh, as uh, the Cecilia said, I am Eric Mugawa and I am the executive director of Oasis Health. Uh, I want to take you a little bit of how Emara is in Rwanda. Uh, Emara is the currently a new topic to most of Rwandans, either policymakers, healthcare providers, uh, and you can see we do not have current epidemiological data that can tell us how the problem is currently. Yeah, but uh, we have a, a study that was done and it shows that the already MRI is at high peak, though we don't have a, a national data. So this was done in a, a teaching hospital and showed that at least 58% of uh, isolates of E. coli were resistant to most commonly used antibiotics. And um, another thing we have in Rwanda, that we don't have a a specific module about MLA in healthcare providers curriculum. So you can imagine a doctor, a pharmacist or a nurse can complete his undergrad degree without being introduced to MLA. So this is a, a very challenge uh, that we are facing in Rwanda because our healthcare providers are not informed about this very important um, Uh, Rwanda is other countries in Africa and most of of Southern Africa is still a low limited resource country. Here we have a very limited healthcare providers, few doctors, few nurses, few midwives. So we tend to have that issue as well. And uh, we still have the limited facilities that can help us to prevent further MLA uh, spreading, like hand washing stations are still scarce, and even access to antibiotics, first of all, quite antibiotics, uh, it is still a, a challenge as well. We have also much more things that are happening in Rwandan healthcare system. Next, um, taking you more about our antibiotic stewardship program. Uh, this is a program that intends to mobilize policymakers and institutions in Rwanda uh, to work on antimicrobial resistance. Among policymakers include the Ministry of Health and the Rwanda Biomedical Center, the implementing entity of the Ministry of Health, and the other academic institutions, uh, being University of Rwanda and the other higher learning institutions. Uh, even uh, the institutions that regulate healthcare providers, like uh, councils or organizations where pharmacists meet or where nurses and doctors meet. Uh, we are also targeting front trainers who should be at the forefront in containing antimicrobial resistance. Uh, those front trainers, we call them healthcare providers. Uh, you know, they are the one to prescribe antibiotics, they are the one to dispense antibiotics. They are the one who administer antibiotics and uh, they are the one who's supposed to know what is antimicrobial resistance so that they can even educate their patients how to prevent antibiotic resistance. Uh, even in their daily practice, when you dispense, when you prescribe, so you need to do it responsibly uh, to make sure that they will know nothing you are doing that should be promoting MRI. Uh, we want to make uh, Rwanda and healthcare providers antibiotic stewards, so those mean people who take care, who always think about preserving antimicrobials uh, in their daily health activities. We aim to train at least one healthcare provider per healthcare facility in Rwanda who will work as a steward and motivate and encourage our fellow healthcare providers to, to do the same, to do uh, take the course and the other things that will make them uh, antibiotic steward as well. Uh, we are developing a CPD, a continual professional development course uh, that healthcare providers will do 
uh, to get CPD credits, you know, healthcare providers need to train uh, continuously so that they keep their practice perfect. So we are making this course to make sure that they can do it to, to get the credits, but uh, inward to also read about MRA, to learn their law, to learn how they can prevent MRA in the daily clinical practice. Uh, this program will also include peer-to-peer -peer teachings that will be happening in hospitals and health centers uh, between trained uh, healthcare providers and you know, the trained ones. Uh, our methodology, we started with the endorsement with um, the institutions I said before, the policymakers and the other academic institutions, including the Rwanda Biomedical Center, the Universal Rwanda, the Rwanda Medical and Dental Council, uh, the Rwanda Nursing Middle of Union, and the Allied Healthcare Providers Institutions. I will also mobilize the stakeholders, including hospitals that will be giving doctors and um, health centers that will be giving nurses to be trained. Um, then we are in this stage of course development where we have uh, engaged with professionals and microbiologists and infectiologists uh, to develop a disciplinary course that will be taken by the healthcare providers. We also engage with a pharmacist and nurse and a public healthcare professional, even a patient advocate to make sure that everyone who will go through this course will get necessary information to make him or her a required or unneeded antibiotic steward. Um, after getting the course uh, fully developed and certified, we plan to, to do outreach of trainings where we train the so-called antibiotic stewards, and then those uh, stewards will go peer-to-peer -peer teachings among other healthcare providers in the healthcare settings. And we will post restorative hospital charts uh, that will show minimal or like the most thing to be done to prevent MRI in healthcare settings. Uh, we aim to a long-term impact because this course now will be a long-term course that can be used for years and years. And the, the chat will be in hospital, will be educating healthcare providers on a daily basis. Uh, we also expect much more actions from um, our mobility stakeholders, those organizations and policymakers. Uh, currently, those are the organizations mobilized. I said them before, the Rwanda Biomedical Center. This is the implementing entity of the Ministry of Health. So it's the one that works on field, that implements the policy and the activities that should be uh, being implemented by the Ministry of Health. Now we have Universal Rwanda. This is the most biggest and oldest university in the country. And it's the one that is educating most of the healthcare providers in Rwanda. Uh, we are collaborating with the National Council of Nurses and Midwives so they can provide the nurses and the midwives to take the course. We're also working with the Rwanda Medical and Dental Council, this like great medical doctors and dental surgeons. Another one is the allied healthcare providers are those people who work at the hospital but who are not doctors and who are not nurses and not pharmacists. Also, we collaborate with the National Pharmacy Council uh, to provide the pharmacists. You know, pharmacists are the one to, play, uh, to dispense drugs, to, to educate patients on how to take medication. So they are key personnel in this project as well. I want to introduce you also our professionals. We have a Dr. Roger Harrison, uh, is a UK personnel and director from the University of Manchester and uh, hold a PhD in public health and the, an activist against Yamara. We have Dr. Noel Gahamani, is a lecturer from University of Rwanda, hold a PhD in microbiology. He is also helping in our course development. Uh, we have a Vanessa Carter. Vanessa Carter is a patient advocate and um, he, she has a very high expertise in patient education and patient advocacy and he is also a very strong MRI activist. Uh, we have a, a pharmacist called Tuishime. Uh, this one is a, a local pharmacist who works in the community pharmacy that used to dispense medications either on prescriptions or over the counter. So we expect him to bring him a real life experience in this course and the real recommendations that pharmacists who dispense medication on their basis should be flowing. Uh, we have Oscar Mugisha is a registered nurse and the one health um, activist is also a registered nurse who works in mainly in one health sector who will also bring his expertise in one health field in this course of development. 
Uh, our objectives is to make sure that the Emala is no longer an abstract to any Rwandan, uh, including doctors, including other healthcare providers, uh, including healthcare leadership and even policy makers. Because if this is something that is uh, affecting modern medicine, it should be taken seriously. And we want to mobilize everyone who has a world in healthcare settings to be a steward who should be preventing his further development of MRM. Uh, we want to create a mindset changing to Rwandan healthcare providers. We, we call them the four frontliners uh, who should be containing MRM daily. So we want to change their mind toward a, an antibiotic saving mind so that they preserve uh, the current antimicrobials. Uh, we aim to mobilize more than 3,000 healthcare providers to take the course. Uh, in a period of 12 months. And we aim at least that each hospital and health center in Rwanda should have a chart. When you move around, you can see a chart for HIV, chart for TBs, but no one for MRA. But currently, when you look on statistics, MLA is killing more people compared to those uh, very common disease. So we want to make sure that people also here are recognizing their mind that MLA is a serious issue. Um, so this program is a bit uh, special and is very encouraged because it is multidisciplinary and uh, you know MRI is cross-cutting, it affects humans, it affects plants, it affects animals. When you come to healthcare settings, uh, when the patient is not involved, uh, when a doctor, when a pharmacist is not involved with the nurse, uh, the success is known. So we want to make it multidisciplinary uh, so that everyone is engaged and everyone is able to play his role so that during tree, we can have something tangible. Uh, it is focused on Rwandan context uh, because Rwanda is has its specific context compared to other internationally available courses. Uh, because you have a, our commonly used antibiotics, you have a the commonly accessible antibiotics, you have a very limited number of healthcare providers, you have a limited number of hand washing facilities and other uh, factors that should be helping us to contain MLA. So we wanted to make it very specific to run and context uh, to make sure that uh, the current people who are working in healthcare settings in Rwanda find themselves in this course and then make it easy to apply uh, the recommendations or the knowledge that will be uh, acquired from the course. Uh, it is education based and it provides CPD credits uh, because it's a common practice for healthcare providers uh, to train themselves as uh, they are in practice. So this is also an added value. And we target those in practice because they're the one on the field, are the one who are causing the problem uh, and should be the one uh, solving the problem. Uh, thank you so much for being with me. Uh, this uh, project is being implemented by Oasis House in Rwanda with the support from Power Foundation. So you are feel free to contact us for further collaboration in containing MRA. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Eric. Uh, I think your project is really interesting. And I'm, I think you're doing a really good job with uh, the CPD uh, effort because that helps uh, health professionals continue to be educated and, and count that in their uh, daily work. So I think it's a really, really important uh, project that you're running uh, and we're very happy to support you. So thank you. Well, with that, should we then um, move over uh, across the planet <laughs> and uh, uh, end up in India instead. Uh, we work together with uh, Jaspreet Mahindro and uh, you're working on a completely different project. You're looking into supporting and, and educating farmers in India instead. So Jaspreet, please uh, tell us about your project. Thank you, Cecilia, for uh, the nice introduction and giving this opportunity to me. Okay, so um, going on to the next slide. Yeah, so uh, my my study is actually about educating the poultry farmers, and we want to understand the role of poultry farmers in reducing the antimicrobial resistance. 
So uh, as we all know, uh, the problem of antimicrobial resistance is already grave and it is expected to increase in the coming next few years, where estimates have made that by 2050, uh, the lack of uh, effectiveness of antibiotics will cause around 10 million deaths, which is like a huge problem. And one of the major root of these antimicrobial resistance is through food chain, where antibiotics are used in the food producing animals or in animal husbandry for various reasons. So uh, here on this slide, on the left side, you can see there's a global map showing the uh, antibiotic consumption in the livestock. And you can see uh, that India has a very high percentage of antibiotic consumption. The problem with antibiotic consumption in animal husbandry is also that the antibiotics or the classes of antibiotics used there are very common to the antibiotics which are used for treating the human infections. So there is a considerable overlap of these antibiotics being used, which result in the cross resistance, making the antibiotics that are used in humans treat, uh, treating the human infections, making them ineffective. So this is not only uh, affecting the animals, but also uh, affecting the humans. So, uh, next. Now, to talk about the poultry sector in India, uh, the poll, um, it is the uh, it is the most uh, recently revolutionized uh, sector, uh, animal husbandry sector in India in the last two decades. Initially, the, most of the poultry were reared as a backyard poultry, but now uh, this industry has revolutionized, and around 80% of the farms are commercially or organized poultry farms. Now, because this has been possible because there is an increased demand in, and changes in the lifestyle, which have resulted in more consumption of the poultry products. Now, because of the higher consumption, this has resulted in the intensive poultry farming. And as a consequence of this intensive poultry farming, now more and more birds uh, or the poultry birds are being cultivated in the crowded space. In a limited space, they're trying to cultivate more uh, birds, which is resulting in the uh, resulting these farms as the breeding grounds of zoonotic diseases. Because of the close proximity, there are chances of more zoonotic diseases emerging. And to avoid them, the farmers are using these antibiotics <clears throat> and to prevent these infections. Also, these uh, antibiotics help in uh, growth promotion. Now, because of this unrestricted use of antibiotics, it is resulting in the emergence of antimicrobial resistant bacteria. Now, to add to this problem, uh, the, the problem of lack of awareness among the farmers, insufficient financial resources, there's lack of diagnostic facilities, and if there is access to unregulated uh, use of antibiotics. The, these are the various reasons which are adding to more emergence of antimicrobial resistant bacteria on these farms. Now, there are various ways where we can uh, combat these antimicrobial resistance, uh, such as uh, development of better diagnostic tools, following infection control and prevention practices, having uh, more research and development for uh, newer antibiotics, vaccines, or other alternatives, having a better waste management and following the national action plans and AMR programs, better surveillance, and a coordinated response from across all sectors, and one of, and the last and the most important one is creating awareness to educate and motivate. So I will be using this uh, this method of creating awareness about antimicrobial resistance. That is to educate and motivate. So I will be uh, trying to understand, educate, and motivate our poultry farmers' behavior towards the ant uh, judicious antibiotic use. So uh, talking about my study, uh, for my study, I will be uh, involving the commercial. Sorry, can we go back, please? So I will be uh, uh, involving the commercial poultry farmers, uh, which are uh, which are situated in the northern states uh, of Punjab and Haryana in North India. So here, this is the map of India. And uh, you can see I've highlighted two regions of Punjab and Haryana. Uh, so these are the two regions which have the in most intensive poultry farms in the country, where uh, both the broiler and the layer farms are situated. And I've highlighted on the right, you can see there are places which have been highlighted where we'll, these are the target sites for our sampling. 
so we will try to uh, we will try to involve around of a hundred poultry farmers and this um, for this study we will be doing a two stage cross uh, sectional sampling so this sampling will be done at an interval of three months and at each stage of sampling we will have two modules uh, we will have a module of social science and microbiology so to talk about what is there in these modules in for the social science first of all we will have a questionnaire with, uh, where we will try to collect the baseline uh, data of antibiotic usage on these farms so what are the components of these questionnaires they are basically major uh, three parts the first part is to about collect the basic demographic and the farm details of the farmers such as their name age gender education number of years of experience of working in this uh, industry and the farm location the second part uh, talks about the farming practices that they use related to the antibiotic use such as the reasons for antibiotic use what are their choices for antibiotics the source of the prescription and from where they procure the antibiotics what are the duration and the mode of administration they use what are the details of veterinarian doctors they consult to and importantly what are the biosecurity measures they follow to prevent these uh, use of antibiotics and prevent infections and the section c or the third part is Uh, is a series of 25 questions which are basically the true and false questions majorly designed to understand the knowledge and perception of the farmers about the antibiotics and antimicrobial resistance so uh, from these questionnaires we will have certain themes based about about their behavior and from that uh, th based on those themes we will have we will design an uh, topic guide for conducting an in depth interviews and then these in depth interviews of the farmers will be conducted and at the same time we will be uh, rectifying their doubts and um, clarifying them the better practices for um, uh, and for better antibiotic usage simultaneously at the same time we will also be conducting a microbiology module where uh, at each farm visit that we will be collecting a representative poultry fecal samples from the farms and then these fecal samples will be processed for isolation micro processed microbiologically for isolation of e coli bacterium we have targeted e coli bacteria because it is a key indicator organism uh, which is found in all the poultry birds and it is a commensal not a pathogen so this uh, e coli will be uh, tested for antimicrobial susceptibility to various antibiotics so now uh, so when once we have conducted the first round and we have educated the farmers about uh, the good practices so after 3 months we will be doing another similar round to understand how much their uh, knowledge has improved and how much of their uh, perception and uh, understanding has changed so after 3 months when we do the microbiology section we can also see from the antimicrobial resistance levels if there is an improvement or if the resistance levels remain the same then after that uh, we will have a focus group discussions these fgds will have a mixture of the farmers the farmers who have shown a positive change in their attitude and the ones who show uh, resistance to the change so when these groups a mix of groups will have a discussion each of the farmers will uh, either place uh, or will they bring out their problems and the farmers who have shown a positive change can share their experiences and tell them how it is possible to bring about these change so there will be an exchange of ideas between the farmers to bring about a positive change the basic idea to do this is it's always easier to understand from uh, your peer group uh, about how to carry on a change rather than taking from someone who's coming from the outside so this is the main reason of having these focus group discussions and in the end i also hope to find a uh, one or two poultry farmers who have actually who can be like an idol to the other farmers and have an idol farmer talk something like a ted talk so we can also have the recording of these sessions and it can be distributed to various platforms to create more awareness to, across a wider area so from this study i uh, we have some basic expected outcomes such as we will be able to generate a baseline database of the antibiotic usage on the indian poultry farms uh, we'll be able to understand the farmers behaviors the perceptions and challenges that influence antibiotic usage 
also create awareness among farmers about judicious antibiotic usage and uh, antimicrobial resistance, motivate them towards using better or uh, other alternatives to antibiotics and by using and following better biosecurity practices. And uh, in the end, uh, through microbiological module, we will also have a collection of multi-drug resistant E. coli, which can be used further for more genomic studies. So uh, these are some photos uh, from a recent poultry farm visit. So on the top, uh, the right and left images are basically uh, my sampling areas from the broiler and the layer farms. On the right below, you can see I've been interacting with a uh, farmer uh, where we am filling the questionnaire. Uh, and on the left below, we can see we're going through the various uh, storage houses of the poultry farm to see what um, medicines, vaccines, or antibiotics they use. So we're going through each of their collection to see what they use on their farms. So uh, talking about the study, uh, I have these four mentors who have helped me, um, who are going to help me further on this, uh, guiding me through this project. And uh, the idea for this study also came up uh, through while I was doing my PhD project, where we, I was visiting these poultry farms. So during uh, my visits and sample collection, I realized there's a huge lack of awareness uh, amongst these poultry farmers, and they do not know what are these antibiotics and what are the side effects of using these antibiotics here. So that is when me and my chief guide, that is Dr. Neelam Taneja, we decided that there needs to be a program to create awareness among these uh, poultry farmers. And that's where this idea for the study came up. So uh, Dr. Stephen Baker will be actually helping me through the genomic studies of E. coli, uh, where we'll be doing whole genome sequencing of these E. coli strains. Dr. Manmeet uh, is actually a public health specialist, uh, and she will be uh, guiding me through the social science uh, component. And Dr. Manish Kakkad is uh, also a public health specialist. He will be overall uh, guiding me through the various uh, components of the project. Thank you. Thank you, Jaspreet. Uh, I'm very fond of this project. I think you're taking on a very brave and uh, big task to educate the farmers in India. It's a big country. Uh, it's very important. And I, I especially like the fact how you engage the, uh, the farmers themselves to, to be part of the workshops and also hoping that you find these idle farmers that... Uh, will be able to spread their insights to, to their peers. So good luck, and uh, we're very mm -hmm. happy to, to work with you. Thank, Thank you, you. That leads me back to um, Africa, actually. Uh, we're moving back to um, uh, Africa and Kenya this time. And uh, in Kenya, we work together with Daniel, you are uh, taking on a task to uh, uh, educate ambassadors, I'm going to call them, uh, to uh, be uh, talking about and educate their peers in um, AMR as well. So, Daniel, please uh, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecilia. And I'm really glad to be here. I hope you can see me. Um, and I hope my video will allow me to uh, share through that in case of any network planning, I'll just uh, have it off. But it's a great pleasure to join. Thank you so much, Nipron, for joining. And I'm happy that I can see some of uh, the, the students that you engage in the program. They are here and also some of the people that have also engaged with in terms of uh, mentorship. So thank you so much. So, um, so we are running a program uh, that's called the EMR Ambassadors Program for Young People in Africa. And the key goal of this program is to catalyze AMR efforts. And this is by promoting multidisciplinary engagement and also uh, seeing how we can ignite grassroots uh, student-led interventions. And those are my contacts there, so feel free to uh, reach out. So this is the program's website. It was a fence program uh, where uh, we had different applications uh, from uh, students all over Africa and then uh, went through a rigorous uh, selection process and then um, some are selected and now engaging the program. Thank you. So why this, pro uh, why this program? Uh, we've been working with students for quite some time now. And one of the things that we realized uh, in our anecdotal uh, evidence and also uh, 
interacting with different students and so the different papers that have been published is that you know we have a we lack a sustainable uh, AMR students led interventions and this is at the grassroots level especially at the universities and the local communities and what happens is sometimes we have sparks just uh, across uh, world antimicrobial awareness week but we lack these uh, sustainable frameworks that can ensure continuous um, engagement in AMR and also we have very few youth led uh, multidisciplinary engagements in AMR you find that sometimes even when you have these sessions uh, most of them are siloed uh, depending on their different courses and unlike other challenges for example is in Maridio, we find that uh, we have a lot of innovations that are going on in AMR we have very few innovations and initiatives uh, among early career students and sorry early careers and students that uh, address AMR and also find that uh, there's, there's very low interest you know uh, AMR affiliated careers um, they haven't, you know, people really don't understand what needs to be done or well, how can you pursue a, a career that is affiliated to AMR after school. And this is very critical because uh, we need more expertise uh, being channeled into AMR if you are to uh, come up with a sustainable solution. So how are we solving this problem? So we have, uh, we are running the one year pilot program and this is the AMR ambassadors program for young people in Africa. And uh, we're engaging highly motivated students, uh, which uh, these are uh, students who are selected after a very rigorous process uh, through a well-guided uh, rubric that was available. And uh, the aim is to try and trigger multidisciplinary engagement, uh, try to bring about cross-learning and uh, see how we can ignite with them these student-led interventions at their different uh, communities. And uh, with all this, we hope that we'll be able to come up with a launch pad for sustainable local EMR student-led interventions. So I'll just take us through the progress. So as I said, it is a PENS program uh, where we, ha we had uh, 925 applications uh, in groups 185. So it's a program that uh, students uh, engage in groups. And one of the key things is that in the constitution of the groups, uh, we have, uh, students from the healthcare setting and those ones from the non-healthcare setting just to try and bring about multidisciplinary engagement and so we received applications from 13 countries and interesting is that we had over 50 courses that were represented and this is really um, key because one of the things that we also noted during the, the, the selection process is that sometimes it required because such programs really attract people in the medical sector but sometimes it required the you know students within uh, pursuing medical courses, uh, healthcare courses, to go and train. You know, in a way, create awareness among other students who are not pursuing uh, medical courses, so that at least they're able to come up with a team. So in a way, even the application process was kind of an awareness. You know, some people also got to realize, that, you know, okay, this is AMR. So and what you can do about it. So that's also uh, the graph on the left, the pie chart is uh, uh, just the uh, distribution of applicants that we receive per country. So what is the progress? So we started with uh, developing a curriculum, a guided curriculum that was uh, uh, with a, a lot of guidance from uh, key experts that were engaging in the program. And uh, we looked at a systemic approach where we, uh, we had uh, sessions in phase one, we have phase one for the program, we have phase two and we have phase three. So phase one for the program, uh, we looked at uh, having sessions right from the basics of AMR and delving into, you know, one health approach and other detailed topics, uh, for example, governance. So that at least uh, the students that we're engaging have uh, an entire understanding of AMR as an issue. So uh, we are coming towards the end of phase one, which is ending this, uh, December started around uh, late September. So it has really been an intensive program and uh, we've been having uh, weekly webinars with the, with the students. And as you'll see in the other slides, this was complemented by other forms of learning. And uh, we had uh, multiple per week and um, around that webinars in phase one. And these webinars were with very high level experts. Uh, well, you can see those are some of the uh, snaps from some of the, of the speakers we've had. And one is there, the first one is with Dr. Prinish, uh, who is a medical microbiologist, PhD. We have Dr. Jorge from FAO. We have Candace and uh, Oluchi. These are pharmacists and a nurse from South Africa who have really engaged a lot and have published a lot in uh, antimicrobial stewardship, 
we have Dr. Rupa, who's really done a lot of work in um, EMR in conflict settings. And we have uh, anthropology from Dr. Claire Chandler, who is also uh, a key pioneer of anthropology in EMR from that sector. So we tried to bring very high level experts uh, who really have a lot of knowledge and experience in EMR, but you also looked at it also from local experts, especially in the African setting, who can also educate us on what is happening uh, within Africa and what are the key interventions that we can come up with. So we also, uh, just to complement the learning, we also had uh, an EMR short course that uh, we are currently pursuing. So, and it was quite, um, interesting because just by uh, reaching out to University of Manchester and engaging with Dr. Rogers, we were able to uh, kind of redesign the course once again and have it, before it was just, it was a very simple course, but now it's housed actually within the university's Blackboard Forum, where students can actually, not just students uh, with who are pursuing the program, but even after, uh, any other person can pursue now the course and also get a, a, a certificate from this. So the aim is just to complement the webinar learnings that we've been having and also the, some of the remote learning through the weekly reading resources. So we also have Saturday workshops that are student-led and the essence of this is just to, uh, you know, to hear out students, uh, have them have a platform where they can share their ideas. And it's not just about learning. We also try to uh, celebrate our diversity and we have um, activities like culture sessions where people get to you know, showcase uh, the different traditions uh, within, uh, the, you know, within their countries and within their ethnicities. And this really uh, creates a feeling of community and it helps uh, strengthening the bonds and relationships which uh, goes ahead and also, you know, promotes a lot of multidisciplinary engagement uh, among the different students. So we have also uh, we also have interactive learning sessions, and these are group sessions now, group discussion sessions uh, among the students. Um, and sometimes we use different methods to uh, group them. We have random sessions, others are structured in uh, different ways. And this is to challenge them, you know, to take up leadership skills, uh, have critical thinking skills. And one of the things that we do is, uh, you know, we have uh, questions and we have presentations that they do. And the questions are awarded, uh, are designed in a way that it will, you know, help them come up with very creative uh, designs and interventions to what they're addressing. And this is really important for us because it help, helps us realize how much have they understood about you know, what is being shared. And also uh, in terms of forming relationships, which uh, can go even beyond this program. And as we've come, uh, been uh, finishing on phase two, we've been having feedback sessions in terms of focus group discussions uh, with, uh, with, the, with, the, with the groups. And the essence of this has been to just get, you know, their feedback uh, concerning how phase one has been. And this is, will be very important for us as we are going uh, on with this. Then in case of the program. So these are some of the pictures with, with uh, some of the students. Being wild and microbial in this week. And um, one of the reasons that we did this was to try and expose students, the, the participants, to what is really happening within their communities. How can you come up with interventions? How do you forge collaborations? How do you go ahead and, um, you know, uh, penetrate the community? So it was a really uh, uh, impactful session, gauging from the feedback that we've been getting from them. And we're happy that they were able to appreciate. And the essence of this is that as we go to phase two, which will really focus on project management, already they have a feel of what happens in the community. So, and the other thing is that we're also in, uh, lucky to be invited in different forums. Uh, one was the AMR National Symposium in Kenya to talk about the role of uh, young people in terms of AMR and also in a, in a panel session and also to discuss, uh, to present on what we are doing in the program. We also invited to a youth summit uh, to share more uh, on the same two and some of the things that, you know, young people can take up uh, and run with uh, in the AMR field. So these are just pictures of our different uh, ambassadors and they really did a lot of work right from, you know, walks, uh, walks within cities, we had radio sessions, educating students. So we, we really saw a lot of diversity uh, in how they did. And the key was that at least it helped in terms of uh, improving the exposure and also their skills in terms of community engagement. 
So we will be starting on phase two in uh, January and phase two will be structured that will have expert lectures. Uh, we also have remote resources and um, uh, brief uh, key takeaways on project management. And the essence is to equip them with skills that can you know, help them out there, come up with strong interventions and also uh, capacitate, capacitate in the way that they can also write proposals and come up with business plans that they can you know, pitch and uh, get funding to run the opportunities and also be able to monitor and evaluate what they are doing in, in the best way. And uh, this will be running in parallel with a mentorship program um, that will also be running with different key stakeholders, depending on the student interest areas. And one of the things that we'll be doing is that they will be engaging in a simulated project um, development exercise where uh, students who are interested in, uh, in a particular area in EMR, they'll come up with a project and they'll be guided all through in terms of conceptualization, in terms of development, and then they'll then present the simulated project to um, an expert panel who can then offer them feedback on how to improve on the same. And we hope that these, they'll be able to replicate this into actual uh, into the actual projects come phase three, and also thereafter when they're trying to come up with initiatives on AMR. So, these are the organizations that we have been collaborating with and um, are quite many and each one of them has really been helping us in terms of their different areas of expertise. And um, we've, uh, behind these organizations, we've been having so many experts who have really engaged with us as guest speakers, as um, mentors, as advisors to the program, and uh, we really appreciate all of them. So what do we hope to achieve from all this? One, we hope that the program will have a ripple effect in terms of AMR awareness and engagement. As we have already seen uh, during the week, there was a very uh, big reach, which we are still analyzing and trying to quantify. And this is through the application and extension of knowledge and skills acquired in the program. We also hope that this will increase interest um, and help many more students transit to AMR affiliated careers after they finish their school. And we hope that this will also help in terms of coming up with innovations and initiatives uh, among early careers and students, you know, from different diverse backgrounds. We were having a chat with uh, in one of the architecture students in one of the feedback sessions, and we would really appreciate that they now see, um, you know, the role of architect in infection prevention and control and also AMR. So these are some of the key things that we are looking at. How you can still, you know, within your, uh, expertise how can you then come up with interventions on emr and the project being experimental we hope that the outcomes generated uh, will provide us with uh, insights on how to scale up to come up with a scale up model to catalyze uh, this multidisciplinary engagement and also to uh, have a way of coming up with sustainable local uh, youth-led interventions so some of the tips for change i one of the things that came out for us is that we've been able to learn and also unlearn so much. And this has been uh, engaging students, uh, the participants in what we do and having a lot of feedback and communication um, uh, among us so that is able to package it in the best way for them. And uh, I think it's also important to understand our target group and uh, we've really tried this very much. And the other thing is to collaborate and bring different expertise on board. Also, it's good to have a well-designed uh, strategy of what you're trying to achieve, and you can only have a good strategy if you understand what you want to deliver. Yeah. So I think this is the end of it, and you can learn more about the program in the program's website. We're also very active on Twitter, and you can also reach out to us. Uh, we would love to engage. So thank you so much for listening to me, and, uh, and thank you so much for also joining the session. Thank you, and over to you. Thank you, uh, Daniel. I think your program is extremely exciting because you have built a fantastic network across across Africa, actually East Africa. And I, I think you're you're doing a really, really good job. It's amazing to see all the uh, different partners and people that you engage in. You build this strong local network that I love to see as you describe it now with all the activities that are happening and uh, it's very encouraging so thank you so much <laughs> thank you thanks cecilia and thank you for the support from us thank you with that we've listened to three of our grantees now and i think uh, as i've been repeating the projects are 
very inspiring and interesting to learn about. Um, we have now tested to, uh, to hold these seminars and we will continue to do so in uh, the spring. We've built a seminar agenda and uh, twice a month uh, we will have uh, seminars talking about projects from um, our grantees. So I hope to see you there and help us spread the word. Uh, the next one is already tomorrow, actually. We have one tomorrow on uh, exploratory studies in elderly care. That would be the last one we do for the year. Uh, but uh, if you're interested to join, uh, please ping me afterwards and we'll make sure that you can do that. We will also post uh, an impact report in January on the work that has been done during 2022. Uh, as Daniel and Jespreet and Eric said, we will also continue to engage with you in the social media, similar to what they already are doing. And then remember that we open our grant call 2023 in end of January. So if you or a friend of yours have a good project that should be in need of funding, make sure that you stay tuned and apply to that. With that, uh, thank you so much for uh, joining me today and um, have a fantastic rest of the day and uh, enjoy the holiday season coming up as well. So um, thank you, Eric, Jespreet and Daniel. Uh, thank you for joining us today and have a good day. Take care. How about you? Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.